So good afternoon or good morning whenever you watch it. Uh, <laughs> friends. Uh, we have a, a, a very nice person, very knowledgeable person, very experienced person, and not last, uh, a very good friend of mine uh, from Italy, Mr. Alessandro Minotto Rizzo. Alessandro, if I may call you still Alessandro, after how many years? 30 years of friendship. So uh, Alessandro is, is one of, the, one of the, the big shots of NATO. He has been Deputy Secretary General for, for many years in the beginning of the 21st century. And he has been Interim Secretary General as well. So he knows NATO inside out. Uh, when he left NATO, um, a little more than 10 years ago, he didn't stop to work for NATO. He is now the, the, the uh, founder and the president of the, uh, uh, of the NATO Defense College Foundation in Rome, of which I'm uh, very happy and honored to be a member of the advisory board. So uh, we start with, with Mr. Minuto Rizzo, with Alessandro, with the, uh, the question. Uh, and the question is the following. What did the world look like when you were in uh, NATO headquarters and how does it compare to today? Well, uh, it's a very good question because you oblige me to think about, uh, about very different things, in fact. Because, uh, I, of course, I mean, uh, you asked me a question I had not prepared before the answer, but if, if you ask me, you know, how the world looked at the beginning of 2001, when I joined NATO, just a few months before 9-11, let's say it was still, in a way, a traditional world, if I can use this word, because traditional is not, is not perhaps the best uh, expression, but let's say it was a world which was very close to the end of the Cold War. Uh, it was a moment where the uh, Soviet Union had collapsed not long before. Uh, the process of accession of uh, former, uh, let's say, Central European countries was underway, both in NATO and the European Union. And uh, the feeling was perhaps that we were living in a place with a unilateral, uh, unilateral great power. Uh, which was the United States of America. And that was a sense, uh, which was also, can I say, a sense that was mm, animated by some people in the United States, you know, and we've forgotten about this group of people, of course, we're speaking about 20 years ago, but the so-called neocons, you know, people who thought that America had a moral role to play in the world and that it was justified to play a, be a very ambitious foreign policy to, to simplify, to simplify things. Uh, and then, of course, at that moment, uh, we were still in the uh, aftermath of the dissolution of Yugoslavia. So that was really something uh, that we have forgotten a little bit because human beings are like that. We forget things when they are past, you know. Perhaps we survive because of that, maybe. I don't know. I don't want to be too philosophical. But certainly uh, it has been a period, a very difficult one. Because if you remember, because NATO, in fact, has never been at war. They never fight the coup. I mean, there was a Cold War, and the Cold War is a different thing. Uh, but uh, Bosnia was different. Bosnia was different. Bosnia the Govina, we had boots on the ground. I remember Sarajevo very well. I remember what it meant for the public opinion in Europe, watching a TV, a, a city would be destroyed by bombs. Uh, after that, we had Kosovo, which was, was also very, very bloody and very difficult, not also from a human point of view, not only from a political point of view. Uh, and then less important, if you like, but still Macedonia. Because when I, <laughs> it's a personal story, if you like, because when I arrived at NATO, I think it was in July 2001, uh, the Secretary General, Lord Robertson, uh, left for holidays. And in a very British way, 
uh, he's still a good friend of mine. He said, well, Alessandro, you are in charge now. If you have a problem, call me in Scotland, okay? <laughs> I'm not an Anglo-Saxon, but I was prepared to that. <laughs> uh, what happened is that uh, a week later or 10 days later, there was a civil war in Macedonia, you know? And the NATO style, you know, if you are in, ch in charge, you are in charge. I mean, you, you are responsible. People look at you for instructions, you know? And had not the slightest idea what to do, of course, because, uh, you know, that was something new. And so it was interesting for me, very interesting, to deal with the ambassadors representing NATO countries and to see how they were thinking about this new unexpected crisis in, in Macedonia. That we were lucky in the end. There was a NATO operation, essential harvest, but not really a civil war. So we were lucky, perhaps because we intervened in the beginning. And so that was all right. After that, we had Afghanistan. And, you know, I am a, a personal witness of this because uh, Afghanistan was something which we are not prepared to at all. Uh, it was, uh, for, I mean, for, for, for history, if you like, uh, it was not really even a NATO initiative, you know, because if you remember correctly, the United Nations were in charge of security in Kabul after the American, let's say, landing there. And there was a semester of rotation of countries. Uh, then when the Germany, when Germany was in charge, they said, well, but in fact, you know, how can we judge how many people we need in Kabul, the headquarters, you know, and all that. Um, and so uh, it was decided that NATO perhaps was more able to do these things. And in fact, you remember NATO at 9-11 has declared Article 5, reciprocal assistance. So it thought it was justified to go to Afghanistan in that, in that environment. And so we went into Afghanistan, uh, inventing completely from zero a, a new, very difficult operation. So if you ask me questions afterwards on that, I will answer that. But then this was the time of the beginning of the century, let's say. Today, we live in a completely different environment. Uh, you know, in Hungary, in Italy, everywhere because uh, we had the shock, let's say, frankly, of the Trump administration in the United States. So all of a sudden we thought that the multilateral system that rightly or wrongly were put into place after the end of the Second World War was going to pieces. Um, we Europeans were especially criticized for not, uh, especially not paying enough for our own defense. There, are, there may be reasons for that. Uh, and so this is a part of it. The other side of that, um, to confess myself, you know, in front of you, is also a little bit the decadence of Europe, in a way, from a security point of view, I'm speaking not from a cultural or from a philosophical point of view, from a security point of view. Because uh, today, Europe, in terms of military, uh, let's say, power, in terms of power projection, is rather weak. And public opinion in Europe does not like very much to see military actions. If it is obliged, they are obliged, yes, but it is not a first choice. Uh, and then, of course, we have the rise of Asia. And this is the other part of that. And this is the beginning of a new chapter. Because nobody, no, no, none of us knows exactly what will happen in the future. So I don't think we are in a Cold War. I don't think so. But certainly there is a problem because... Uh, uh, to our surprise, unjustified surprise, if you like, uh, China is a very important country, uh, very important, much more than we thought. And it is not, uh, uh, you know, a country, a communist country in a traditional sense no, at all. It's a different kind of thing. You know, personally, I know very well these things yourself. We tried also, I think, to, to have some kind of, uh, of, of personal role into that, uh, even if it's a minimal sense, uh, a few years ago. Uh, and of course, they are one and a half billion people, you know, so if you compare with us, uh, certainly it makes a difference. And it is not the first time that um, uh, students, that writers, that uh, economists think that we are living in a nation century. What does it mean? I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 my brain is only one kilo and a half, I think, and I'm unable to think too much about the future. Uh, but certainly, certainly we're going to be in a different kind of world where what I hope, I mean, as a European, 
uh, is that uh, our values, uh, our knowledge, uh, our history can be sustained, uh, can be living, and uh, can be perhaps continue to lead in different ways. But this is something to be seen, you know. And of course, the other part of the story, and I stopped with that in your first question, is that in America we have now a an administration, the Biden administration, that looks very much like the ones we were accustomed to. So from an instinctive point of view, it's comfortable to us because we know that these people want to be allied with us. They speak about us, they are. So NATO is becoming, you know, a new, a new, can I say, how can I say, a new potential security provider in the future. Uh, let me ask you a, a, a question about uh, today and about NATO. When many people think, uh, some people hope, that NATO has, has outlived its uh, useful uh, uh, time uh, and would like to see NATO uh, go or, or weakened. What do you think? What is the, the usual, but uh, unlike the usual, uh, role of NATO, or is it the usual uh, role plus something that NATO should uh, play in the future? And uh, are we uh, ready to uh, to fulfill this uh, task with NATO? Is NATO ready? Well, you know, I think if I have to summarize, you know, also for the people who will listen to us in the future, you have to summarize what I think that NATO is in the end, you know, there are many ways, of course, you're looking at that. On one hand, you have a political ticket, the Americans say, you know, you have North America and Europe from a political point of view, which is a block of civilizations. It's not the perfect, uh, I mean, expression or something like that. And it is very powerful in the end because it has played the role of certainty a long time. So, I mean, you have to be taken seriously. On the other hand, you have a very well organized military system, uh, which has proved, and there is no rhetoric in there, to be the best in the world. And you and Hungary is a part of that, and you know it very well. Um, there is a interoperability among uh, all allied armed forces, armed forces, which has never happened before in wars. We have alliances many times in history, but you know, there were alliances, there were only for certain purposes, for certain, for certain number of years. For the first time, you have a, a, a military alliance for three generations, I don't know how to count them exactly, uh, where there is really uh, something uh, in common, um, integrated and well-functioning. And, you know, for instance, we speak about Afghanistan. Afghanistan is not a failure of NATO. Af Afghanistan is a failure of politics, is a failure of, uh, I don't want to make name names, not a NATO failure. N NATO has never had a political role in Afghanistan. Never, never. I know it very well from the beginning. It's only supposed to have a security framework, what is the, the Anglo-Saxon expression. So, you know, only that. So this is, this is very important. Now, all this played very well during the Cold War, and it played very well in crisis management, especially in uh, Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia. Now, in the future, of course, it is more difficult. It is more difficult. We have not to hide that. Uh, why? Because the number of countries is uh, much larger. We have 30 countries. And so 30 countries, maybe 30 points of view, 30 views of the world, uh, a long table, you know, everybody has the right to speak. It's not easy to reach a consensus on the the threats, what is the danger, and also what you have to do to, to overcome them. So it is, this is going to be difficult. And uh, I think we have to work more on the political side of NATO. I'm not the first person to say that, of course. Uh, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. Uh, because uh, you have to convince certain countries that Russia is the imminent danger, you have to convince other countries that they should look at the Arab world. <clears throat> you should convince others that China perhaps has to be taken as a, as, a, as a danger. So there is a process of reform, which is starting now, in fact, 
uh, which I hope will be successful, but I'm not sure that it will be successful because it will be difficult. And then let me be technical for a moment, because you know, otherwise we speak about always the big picture, but you are a technical person yourself, so you understand me very well. You know, when NATO was formed, 1949, Washington Treaty, uh, everything was based on Article 5 on common defense, okay? Then in Yugoslavia, we proved to be good in crisis management, okay? And Afghanistan will have followed. But we have a number of countries which are partners of NATO. And if you count them one by one, you will see that there are even more than 30. Then, of course, you have to define what partner means. But let's say the name partner applies. And the treaty and the system of NATO does not really comprehend anything specific concerning partners, which is but a bad thing, because if you want to build a partnership, let's say with the Arab world, for instance, or certain countries of the Arab world, of course, not everybody, you know, uh, well, you need resources there. I don't mean using a British boot on the ground. No, I don't mean that. I mean technical assistance. I mean uh, 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 opening to meetings. Uh, I mean exchange of information, border control, things which are useful for fragile governments to become stronger and against the terrorism. And NATO there, there is not really a system of resources to take care of that. So this is usually overlooked as something, you know, to, it will come later. But no, it should, it should be taken up front. Because, you know, I think that today, frankly speaking, I mean, uh, NATO cannot be justified looking at Moscow uh, or looking only uh, uh, to, to Russia. No, I don't want to go into this discussion. I mean, if you, if you don't want, but I don't think this is justified by that. It's justified by a difficult world, a fragmented world where there are even non-state actors, very powerful, and where you should really use a 360 degrees approach, which is only communicates, but it's not really existing fact, practically, you know. Uh, so, uh, fragile countries should be should be helped in Africa, in uh, in, the, in the Arab area. I don't know about the Indo-Pacific because this is a different. Uh, so, well, into, you will interview next year. I will speak about that, but not today. I have no <laughs> no answer to this. <laughs> I know that there is a project there. I know that people are speaking about this, but you know, again, one thing is to mean by partnership political consultation. It is the easiest thing, you know. You meet once a month with certain persons coming from certain countries. Okay, it's the beginning. But of course, this is not sufficient to, to, to consider this to be a partnership. So I see for NATO, um, not an easy, not an easy task, not an easy task, uh, because uh, the world is much more complicated than it used to be before. Well, Mr. Secretary General, thank you very much. Uh, I think it was a very enlightening and, and comprehensive analysis uh, of, uh, of the situation uh, 20 years ago, almost uh, exactly 20 years ago, actually, and, and today. Uh, let us agree that in five years we return and we will see what of your predictions became, became true and what will be your predictions for the, for the, the, the next uh, five years afterwards. So thank you very much, and I um, uh, I hope that after this we haven't been for for a while because of the the, the COVID uh, pandemics. Um, I hope uh, that this meeting on uh, online will lead to a personal meeting uh, in the uh, very near future. So I I look forward to it, and I I thanks very much once again. Uh, for your readiness to uh, to uh, be able and ready to uh, to give us to this opportunity, uh, and uh, we will be back uh, sooner rather than late. Uh, you are a, a, a very uh, nice and very important person in, in history and also in present. So we will seek your advice also in the future. Thank you very much and. Uh, See you, talk to you, and see you uh, not not too distant future. Thank you. Not Thank you. Thank you to you, and thank you for your friendship. 
and also for your questions because you need a certain courage to ask questions. I mean, <laughs> because you don't know what the answer would be. <laughs> and you have to also to know these questions, first of all. Uh, people don't always ask the right questions. You you do. <laughs> so I did say you know, congratulations for that. I don't say I don't need to say more on this. And of course, um, all the best for you personally, for your family and for Hungary. Thank you, Thank you very much.